Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 10th, and we will hear innovative financing to build market rate apartments in rural areas. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those into the uh, chat box found in your webcast toolbar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2020. Thanks to all those participating APA chapters and divisions for making these webcasts possible and free to members. In particular, today, we are sponsored by the Wisconsin chapter of APA. So thanks to them for pulling this together. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. We are actually booked um, almost all the way through the end of the year. And we're now taking some Wednesdays and Thursdays as well. So when you're registering for these, if you're used to all Fridays, beware, we do have some Wednesdays and Thursdays coming up the pipeline. Uh, so be sure to check out our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast for, uh, for the opportunity to register for these. Um, and on your screen is actually a screenshot of uh, our webcast webpage. Up at the top there, there's a couple tabs, and I just want to explain a couple things. The prior webcast tab, that's where we post uh, PDF copies of all of our previous presentations, so you can download those. And the distance education tab, we do have several webcasts that are available for on-demand viewing through the end of this year. Uh, one is worth 1.5 ethics, the other is worth 1.5 law. So if you are in need of those credits, head over to the distance education tab and uh, you can get more information on how to view those videos and get those credits for free. Uh, today's webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. To log those AICP credits, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and from there you can either search by today's title or the event number. Uh, and if you didn't get a chance to write anything down, no worries, you can find both of those on our webcast webpage. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Like us on Facebook, just search planning webcast uh, in the search box and we'll pop up. That's where we post any last minute changes to our webcasts or when there's a new webcast available for you to register. Uh, so be sure to, to like us on Facebook so you will be in the know. And um, lastly, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and search planning webcast. We'll pop up along with our over 300 videos and you will be friends with over 3,000 subscribers. We do record all of our webcasts and this is where we post them. <clears throat> so I think that is it for all of my housekeeping items. So I now am going to turn it over to Joel West who is today's presenter and he's going to introduce himself and kick things off. And Joel, I am turning those controls over to you right now. All right, and just making sure, see me? Yes, my name is Joel West. I am uh, run my own uh, consulting firm, West Consulting Agency. I've uh, been a planner for 36 years. I uh, started out uh, in planning in Moorhead, Minnesota, and uh, through the years worked my way up to uh, community development director, uh, assistant city administrator, and then uh, finally uh, city administrator uh, for um, Osceola, Wisconsin. Uh, previous communities are Baker, Montana, Worthington, Minnesota, uh, Northfield, Minnesota, where I spent uh, quite a, a big portion of my career, and finally uh, Osceola, Wisconsin for the last nine years. As part of my consulting, uh, I do provide uh, public administration, economic development, community development consulting uh, to communities and private development, and I am currently serving as an interim administrator for St. Croix Falls about uh, eight miles uh, from uh, where I live in Osceola, uh, 
right now. I uh, was a project manager uh, for a development company in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area for a number of years. So I have that side of the development equation also. And, uh, and look forward to uh, providing this presentation today. Thank you. I'll get started here. Okay. All right, should all have that up on your screen now? Yeah, uh, the first great. slide was, okay, good, thank you. Uh, as a kind of my brief history there uh, for, for background. And so we're talking about innovative financing and uh, to build market rate apartments in, in rural areas. Uh, the big question that has come up both in the communities I've worked in and consulted in uh, over the, the last few years is uh, why should the public sector be involved in assisting the creation of market rate housing? Uh, historically, uh, cities have been involved in housing, particularly on the affordable uh, area. I've worked on a number of projects, both uh, development and redevelopment projects, where we created affordable housing or assisted in the creation of affordable housing. It's still a big need in uh, many communities, um, in many uh, states uh, across the nation. But over the last uh, a few years, um, it's been kind of growing, at least in uh, the public uh, elected officials uh, realm, that there's a continued unmet need for housing. We hear it from employers that it limits uh, them in attracting employees. Uh, people are living further from their workplace in order to find housing or to find housing that is uh, um, within their price range. And, and we're also finding from a, you know, from a social perspective that people are not as engaged in the community that they live in. During the time that I was uh, administrator here in Osceola from 2011 to 2019, that was one of the, the, the biggest things I heard anecdotally uh, from people and in, in business owners in the community is, where can I find a place to rent? Where can I find a place to live? I'm moving to the community or moving to the area. So over time, that has, that has grown uh, uh, politically here in the state. Uh, and actually, it grew to the point uh, that the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, the WEDC, I uh, did a white paper, a study uh, here in the state of Wisconsin, uh, and they developed criteria for apartment development to be successful. And this is for uh, market rate apartment development because they were hearing from a lot of communities like ours, uh, the ones that I work in, uh, the same issue. And they concluded that in general terms that a development needed to generate at least $800 per month in rent to be uh, successful to cash flow. Uh, there needed to be some economy of scale, and they calculated a minimum of 49 units for a developer uh, to consider the project feasible. Uh, they found that building values are, are lower in rural areas, meaning the developers uh, couldn't borrow as much against the project, and construction and borrowing costs tended to be the same in all areas. So it put the uh, projects at a disadvantage for attracting you know, uh, uh, loans and, and equity uh, to the project. So the issues that uh, are affecting uh, apartment development uh, was a shortfall of, of ongoing rental income, and we'll see some slides on, on that later, or the cost exceeding the available financing, or most likely a combination of, of both of these issues. So shortly after I started my consulting company about a year and a half ago, uh, I had the opportunity uh, to work with the city of Greenwood, Wisconsin, on a proposed apartment project. And Greenwood is located in the, kind of the north central part of Wisconsin, as you can see on the map. It's between uh, Madison, uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee area, and the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, um, just kind of north and off of the interstate highway. Uh, basically, the Greenwood demographics, it's located in Clark County, Wisconsin, population uh, over 34,000 in the county. The population of the community is uh, just over 1,000, uh, and there's 464 households, 70% owner-occupied and 30% renter-occupied. And this is a map of the, uh, of the community here. Their downtown area is right on this main highway here, but the project location is up in the uh, northwest corner, uh, right up in this area. Just thought I'd throw in some pictures of uh, Greenwood, uh, Wisconsin, so you can see a sense for the community 
uh, you know, sm small farming community uh, in Wisconsin. And the housing issues they faced that th there's workers in the area that could not find housing. And, uh, or if they did, uh, they had to travel uh, quite a ways and up to 60 miles that we were hearing people uh, had to locate to find housing and then commute back and forth to work. Many people wanted to rent for a time before deciding on their next option, uh, whether it was to purchase a home um, or to have a, a home built. Some examples of the need uh, for housing uh, that have come up, you know, anecdotally, is that I had an owner of a duplex in the city of Barron, Wisconsin, that is uh, north and, and uh, west of this location. Um, put a, he had a duplex, put it out on Facebook that he had a unit to rent. Within 24 hours, he had 60 applications uh, for, his, for his unit. And uh, that just points to the need that uh, various studies have uh, pointed out that there is a, a great need for housing. And a lot of times the rental vacancy rates are 1% or even 0% in, in the areas. The other issue that we're facing is for people that want to build a house um, is their contractors, uh, the number of contractors is limited. The Great Recession, um, uh, forced a lot of them out of, out of business. And the ones that are still in business or the few that have started are very concerned um, about uh, building spec homes. So they, they want, you know, pre-approved and, uh, you know, build them for um, a homeowner and uh, instead of building them on spec. So that just slows the process down. And it can take a year or two just to get on the, you know, to get a house built in the, in the community. So in looking at uh, at Greenwood, you get a sense for um, you know the the uh, demographics in, in housing and particularly the rents uh, in the city of Greenwood. It's uh, $556 in Clark County. It's $602. The state of Wisconsin average rents are $813. Uh, so if we base it on 30% uh, of your income uh, to um, have an $800 a month payment, you're looking at uh, $32,000 a year or a little over $15 an hour uh, for uh, for a wage to to accomplish that. So, but in uh, Greenwood, Clark County, um, there are some uh, jobs that do uh, make that or exceed that, but a lot of the jobs are, you can see, between the $10 and uh, $16 an hour. And You'll see some of the companies that are, were interested and were um, pushing for more um, a market rate or housing that's affordable to their workers were um, paying at least starting wages in that $14, uh, $15 an hour. So that'll have an impact on how we look at uh, creating financing and look at financing for these uh, projects. So the local employers in the area around Greenwood were Grassland Cooperative. It's a dairy cooperative uh, in the area and the Greenwood School District and then the uh, Memorial Medical Center in Nielsville, which is 15 miles away. Um, so uh, and you can see that at $15 an hour uh, and then at $20 an hour, what some of the uh, incomes uh, can support for rent. Uh, depending on, on what's being uh, constructed uh, in these areas. So those are the, the issues, and particularly Grassland Cooperative was the uh, impetus behind uh, working with uh, people that he knew in the development business to encourage apartment housing to be considered and built uh, in the area. So the owners, they partnered with a development company uh, out of Milwaukee uh, called For Development. And their proposal is to or build 12, or not 12, 16 to 32 units on a vacant, undeveloped land uh, within the city. And uh, the undeveloped means it didn't have water and sewer uh, to the site, uh, but they, it was platted and uh, ready for um, to be uh, sold and uh, building permits to be issued for that. So they opened up a dialogue with the city to extend utilities uh, and then talked about the need for financial assistance. Uh, their proposed uh, rent, it said they start, their starting wage was $14 an hour, and at 30% of the income, you can see the rent uh, that it, it would generate. Uh, this was the average rent proposed uh, for the development. Um, but in order for the development to cash flow in discussing with the development company, 
they needed at least $840 a month. And the thought was uh, that, and it, and it was uh, borne out by their by their studies that it would could exceed the market. That yes, you could attract some people that could pay the 840 or maybe even more, but the majority of people that would access or want to access the housing uh, would not be able to pay that. So we want to make sure that uh, the the units were rented, and the project was successful. But you had to strike this balance of how to accomplish uh, accomplish that. So the potential city assistance, uh, and actually the only city assistance that was available is the creation of a tax increment district. There are state financing programs in Wisconsin. Uh, they're designed to assist low and moderate income households. Uh, they have uh, you know, grant programs, they have loan programs, they have tax credit uh, programs, uh, but the employees and the people uh, that were seeking to assist with the housing um, made too much money uh, to qualify, uh, did not meet the, meet the standards. So we had to look for a, a program that did not have the income restrictions on it. So the only tool that was available here in Wisconsin is that a tax increment. Uh, the other tools that are available would be direct city assistance uh, from the general fund, but with existing uh, uh, politics and uh, limits on uh, levies for for communities. That's not that's not possible or not practical uh, in that sense. So the tax increment financing and and looking at it is just a couple slides here on just a brief primer for tax increment financing. Uh, basically, um, you start with some vacant property, assuming it's at ten thousand dollars a year, but you redevelop it develop a new project and now the taxes are $100,000 a year. So we can capture the $90,000 a year and use those for a variety of purposes such as sewer and water, storm sewer, other public utilities. Um, affordable housing is one, blight removal, financing gaps in private development, which is what we're talking about here too in addition to uh, public improvement. So that's that's the tool uh, that uh, that we used. Just another slide on how to how to uh, demonstrate this, and I find these slides helpful in talking with the community and uh, and uh, elected leaders that haven't had as much experience with this to visually demonstrate how the uh, tax increment uh, increment works. So here's your captured value over a period of time. And in Wisconsin, we can run from 20 years for most of our tax increment districts. If you're able to create a redevelopment district because you have existing uh, blight or structures uh, to demolish, et cetera, you can go up to 27 years. Another one on tax increment, similar to the first slide uh, that shows uh, what we're doing. Nationwide, just some uh, uh, points here. 49 states and the District of Columbia allow for some form of tax increment financing. In Wisconsin, we can use it to assist uh, housing as part of a mixed-use district. So that district would need to include, um, it can include both platted and unplatted land, has to include uh, elements of commercial or industrial uh, to create the mixed use. And then there are limitations on uh, in creating new housing about density, being at least uh, three units per acre. There are some other requirements to meet also. In Minnesota, where I've done work too, uh, they can be assisted with a redevelopment district or there's some renovation and renewal districts, also redevelopment districts, but they also have a housing district classification and that's primarily for uh, affordable housing. The development proposal that uh, Grassland, but for, for development, uh, looked at was they started with looking at a 16 unit building with an estimated construction cost of $1.2 million. They're looking at mostly two bedrooms, one bath units. They also talked about 32 units in two buildings at a, at a $2.4 million construction cost. Uh, their reasoning for looking at those two options is given the you know the small community the smaller market area than they're typically used to their concern is how fast would it rent up and how long would it take to achieve kind of a stabilized uh, rent and cash flow uh, the site they're looking at uh, we needed to extend uh, street and utilities uh, it's called Linda Boulevard 
and the cost is estimated at $345,000. So their initial request to the city was to extend the street and utilities, and that would be a city cost uh, paid for through the collection of tax increments. Uh, then they were looking for $297,200 in an incentive uh, payment. That'd be, and they calculated it as 25% of the increased value of the property. And that would be paid over a 15 year period of time at 5% interest. So that would have a future value of over $400,000. Uh, you can call an incentive payment. It's basically the, the gap between the rents that uh, they're able to charge based on the market. Uh, to the rents that are needed to actually make uh, a return on investment to make a cash flow as a as a project, and that gets to be the uh, the crux of how do you structure this type of assistance to a de to a developer, uh, balancing the issue of the need for the housing, but also uh, the public dollars that are involved. So we're not as uh, the public or the uh, elected leaders say not unduly enriching uh, a developer. Uh, so there is a balance point in there and that can be uh, calculated. And there are the, the, the public risk, risk assessments. Uh, so what if the developer backs, backs out? And, uh, and there are mitigation strategies and these are discussions that we had with the uh, council as we went through the project and discussed uh, these types of issues. They, they had within the past few years recently had a project, an industrial project where they committed tax increment dollars and then the development did not materialize. So they, they were stuck uh, paying for uh, utilities uh, extended to an industrial site. So it was fresh in their mind, but there was need and this is a different situation. So they were willing to, to tackle this situation also. But one of the ways to mitigate uh, the issue is uh, timing of the uh, development agreement and the start of the project. Uh, we wrote it into the development agreement that um, uh, as they develop their project and are ready to, to start it, you know, building permit issued, you know, plans approved, et cetera, uh, that the public improvements would start around that same time. So we know the project is moving ahead. They had their financing. There's a extremely low chance that they would back out at that point. So that helps minimize the risk to the city of committing to extend the utilities and then the project not happening. The other issue is how do you structure the tax increment or the assistance that they're requesting? There's a pay as you go or what they call pay go instead of an upfront commitment by the city. Uh, this means that the, the de development uh, or the developer will need to wait for the taxes to be collected each year before receiving all or part of the financial benefit. So that depends on the, uh, the situation uh, that's being developed because if you're putting the utilities in, the city needs money uh, for that. So that's an upfront cost. They'll need to bond for it, take out a loan, and then pledge the tax increments to repay that loan. Then the second question is, how do you provide the assistance to the developer? And having them wait for uh, their assistance on a yearly basis you know, after they pay their taxes and you collect the increment is a good way to uh, you know, keep the commitment by uh, the developer and they have uh, some skin in the game, so to speak, to, uh, to continue with the project. The other issue is what if tax collections fail to equal the amounts anticipated or are not paid? Uh, two very good issues uh, when when we're looking at that, uh, because if the tax increment does not rise to the level that was anticipated, for one, if it uh, falls too much, the city could have trouble uh, paying back the bonds that it would issue to finance the public improvements, the streets and utilities, et cetera. Um, mitigation strategies on that uh, would be to you know be conservative in estimating your tax increment collections. Uh, that that helps in case there's some fluctuation. There's at least some some room for uh, for change. Uh, plan for a reserve, and I'll demonstrate that in some future slides of how we accomplish that in our in our analysis. Uh, we also required an assessment agreement that set a minimum value on the property to guarantee a set amount of tax collection. What we wanted to avoid there is um, years down the road or at some point, maybe the developer uh, 
would want to um, challenge the assessed value of the project in a bid to lower uh, the tax bill. Um, but that is counterproductive because lowering the tax bill lowers the amount of money that he'd receive in the future for uh, his, his uh, incentive or gap financing payment uh, with that. But the assessment agreement sets the minimum value and until the tax increment is, is uh, paid off and the district is decertified, uh, that's in effect. And so they can't argue that uh, with the assessor. And then uh, the, you mentioned the utilizing the, the pay-go method uh, just provides that incentive uh, for the developer to pay to pay his taxes. So, so here's the uh, the site uh, in Greenwood. Um, actually, I'll back up one. Missed it. This is the site here uh, in, in Greenwood. These lots here are platted, but sewer and water was, has not been extended uh, to those lots. The district is outlined by this heavy black line. We're able to incorporate you know, vacant land, platted land, and uh, commercial along here. There's more residential here. The wetlands are included, but by state law, they're not part of the tax increment, um, but they can be included within the boundary. So we don't collect any taxes off of, the, off of those. Uh, so this uh, being the site. And this is a map of the site utilities. So phase one is the extension of utilities through Linda Boulevard here. And as we looked, there would be other phases in the future, extending utilities here, some improvements here, extending utilities, and, and possibly extending these roads to connect up to the main highway through the community at some point in the future. Um, other than the development occurring in this area here with the 16 or 32 units that were being constructed, the other ones, there wasn't any um, designated or, or uh, actual committed plans. But as development occurs in the future, um, we could use future tax increments to extend utilities and develop this area further. Uh, the tax increments collected off just the one development wouldn't allow or have the capacity to fund everything. Uh, within this area. So in looking at the one building, uh, uh, we talked about the street extension for $345,000 would be paid off with bond payments that we estimated would be a little over $24,000 a year for a total of uh, over 20 year period of time. And that ends up being a little over $433,000. So if only one building is constructed, um, there would be $8,803 a year, or a little over $158,000 over a 20 year period in additional tax increment available to assist the development. So that would be tax increment over and above the amount necessary to pay off uh, these bonds here. Um, in talking with the developer, and uh, kids, we can see that uh, as we developed uh, kind of the cash flow model, that that was not gonna make the development feasible. And we utilized a, a format uh, such as this to estimate the tax increment. So we have the district being created in 2019 and then a tax collect year. So there is a two year lag time from the time a project is constructed by the time it's assessed and then by the time uh, the taxes are levied and collected. So even though it's a 20 year district, uh, at the most you would get 18 years out of uh, tax increment collections. So here's the uh, estimated tax increment. So the base value of the taxes have been excluded from this number. Uh, the city uh, takes an administrative fee um, out of the tax increments collected. That's for its staff to be able to uh, monitor compliance with the state requirements and also to file the reports required by the state every year. And then it has to be part of your city audit every year. And then at the end of the district, there's a audit of the entire uh, lifespan of the district um, completed. So then uh, the annual tax increment collected is the estimated increment less the uh, retainage or what we call the retainage. And this number here then is 95% of the annual tax increment. And the reason uh, we do that is, as I pointed out earlier, is to create uh, a reserve. Uh, so in case there's some um, issues that come up or uh, payments that need to be made or hope, 
hopefully hopefully it's not necessary but if you need to make uh, bond payments or partial bond payments uh, with this amount because of a delay in tax collections you at least will have a re reserve uh, accumulating for that purpose so this 95 percent is the same as this one over here for the column and this is then the city uh, bond payments that they'd be paying on the infrastructure for the extension of the utilities in the street. So this is the amount available for the pay go or the pay as you go to, to the developer. So the city looked at a counter proposal uh, to the developer. It was a mutual discussion because the 16 unit wouldn't generate enough tax increment. We needed the housing. And, uh, and they could see the need, but they wanted to make sure that they, they limited their risk as far as how, how fast it rented up and uh, the demand for the area. In order to make the development feasible and collect enough tax increment that we felt was needed to create the utilities and to assist the developer, either 32 units had to be constructed initially or two 16-unit buildings, one constructed initially and another within three years, uh, would need to be developed in order to create sufficient tax increment. And then we had the assessment agreement that would uh, uh, set the minimum value of each building at $1.2 million. So we proposed back that the city would extend the street and utilities and pay for that through the tax increment. And the developer then uh, would get excess tax increment over the 20 year life of the district. This would minimize the uh, risk to the city, encourage the developer to construct the units sooner. And uh, once it's stabilized with two buildings, it would be about a little over $41,000 uh, a year uh, with that. As uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, the developer wanted it to be some type of a loan that the city would sign and pay off with tax increment. Uh, the city, uh, in order to minimize its uh, commitments and to minimize uh, its liability said we don't want to have a loan on the books but we will pay you the excess tax increment uh, it's kind of a reduction of risk for the city and the developer then assumes more risk and has more stake into the development so the two buildings uh, constructed at different times uh, same amount for this constructing utilities the bond payment is the same uh, the rents are the tax increment stabilizes at over $41,000. And then uh, and that, that stability starts uh, and there's 14 years uh, with that stability. There's a few years where it's less because there's only one building uh, in, in being taxed at that point. This does generate sufficient cash flow to make the development feasible, but the internal rate of return is 6.1% and a customary uh, minimum for a real estate project for an internal rate of return is 15%. And I'll expand on that in, in a little bit. So in calculating the, uh, the two different buildings, uh, we have building one uh, being constructed here and then uh, building two. And uh, these columns are all similar to before about how we're estimating the taxes and being collected, but you can see that the collections are, you know, 32,000 for the first three years and then up to 65,000 here once the second building is built and comes online uh, for tax collection. Uh, I didn't point it out earlier, but the city can recover uh, the creation, the, the cost it has in creating the tax increment district. It's developing a tax increment plan, having it reviewed by the attorney and any bond counsel that's needed for looking at the the loan and bond documents for the city. So they can deduct that from the, the early years. So it reduces a little bit the, the amount um, that would be available to the developer. We still have to pay off the bonds here. So and look at that, you can see that uh, this is when it starts to be um, bond payments for, uh, not bond payments, but um, uh, financing payments to the developer uh, at this point. And this is how we use to calculate the internal rate of return, uh, this type of a spreadsheet. It's been truncated because it goes out for 20, 20 years. Um, developers um, equity into the project and then the developers cash flow uh, before tax cash flow here. And you can see it's negative in the first few years, which is not uncommon for some developments and then picks up. And then by the, the last the last years, it's up into the $80,000, $90,000 range. And then we calculate the internal rate of return and this is the total dollar amount of, of pay as you go. So the internal rate of return 
as just a, a brief uh, a summary of what that is, is a metric used uh, in budgeting uh, to estimate the profitability of, of investments. So it's been in how much money you have to um, invest. In, in this case, uh, you know, the amount uh, the developer puts in for a construction cost, as opposed to the amount that you're going to receive over time will we'll determine your internal rate of return. And then there's break-even points uh, built within this. In this model here, the internal rate of return is 22%. So it's a net present value of all the cash flows uh, into a development. And it's what developers use to evaluate different developments and their, and their risk. It's one of the tools that they used uh, for that purpose. The, uh, the second uh, one was looking at creating a tax increment with two buildings constructed simultaneously. Again, we have the same the same costs and then more um, more increment coming in for um, and cash to the developer over a little bit longer period of time. There is sufficient cash flow to make the development feasible. The internal return increased to 8.3%, but it's still below uh, the 15%. Uh, this is a, a summary again. And here, the cash flow is a lot higher because we're collecting the increment up in this 66,000 range a lot earlier. Developers getting paid earlier and better cash flow for the developer. Again, this 8.3% uh, internal rate of return. And uh, some people would ask, well, why would they take a, a smaller return um, and consider that successful? And, and the reason uh, they did so is goes back to the uh, Grassland Cooperative is that the owners of that company and the company working with the developer said they will invest in the project along with the developer and their money is more patient money. They did not need to see as high a return as a real estate developer would need on their money. That allowed the developer to have um, you know, access to more patient funds, uh, funds that weren't all bank financing, allows them to have a lower rate of return, still make money on managing the project, some money on his investments. And then the, uh, the grassland um, gets apartments out there. It has more stable housing for its employees and it works well. So this partnership with the, uh, the company really worked well because otherwise it had been difficult unless we built more units for this project to work, but then it might've been overbuilt for the market and then that might not have succeeded either because it may have had a high vacancy rate at the time. So what we did in the final deal structure uh, was to have 32 units either constructed initially or the two 16 unit buildings constructed within three years. Uh, one initially, then one within three years. Sign the assessment agreement. We did have a, an element in there that if the developer backs out of the agreement, the developer must repay the city its cost to create the tax income district prepare the plans and specifications for extending the street and utilities. Um, we didn't have anything in there about repaying it if the city extended the utilities because it was never the intention of the city to start construction unless the construction of the building started at the same time. So it was developer's option to construct either all at once or over three years, depending on how they felt the market was going to be and how fast they could rent those up. The city was willing to uptake, undertake the upfront cost uh, and repay the bond or the loan, but uh, the building construction, like I said, had to happen simultaneously. So they looked at it as a balance between uh, the risk. The developer is taking risk, but also the city would take its risk too. If the developer did back out after one building, which would be a violation of the development agreement, but it could happen, uh, they risked not having sufficient increment um, uh, uh, to repay uh, the bonds. Well. There would probably be enough to repay the bonds, but then to receive their money, they would really risk that for the developer. So the city is taking some risk, but the developer is taking most of it at that point, because with the one building, as you pointed out, that's all the developer is going to get per year, and that doesn't receive uh, an internal rate of return that's anywhere near acceptable to the developer uh, with that. So, so why would we undertake it, uh, this type of development? Well, it's the housing needs in the community were an overriding concern. Uh, both the government, the, the uh, city, the county uh, uh, saw the need, the employer saw the need and came together uh, to fashion something that would work for their community. The local companies in the state, Grassland was the major one, were willing to invest with the developer and accept a lower rate of return. 
and the city was using uh, willing to use tax increment for utility improvements and incentive. And what the city and the other taxing jurisdictions are also giving up is, you know, the use of those increased taxes uh, for a period of 20 years, which they could use for other purposes. So uh, there's always that tension between utilizing that increased taxes for, you know, the street improvements and park improvements, uh, other infrastructure that the, the cities may need. But then again, they want to make sure they have a uh, uh, housing available. They want workers in the community, people living in their community. So it's a it's a good discussion to have to to find that common ground, which they did. But understanding what it means and what the trade offs are. The, the next project I want to look at is in Osceola, and this one uh, is of one where I live. Uh, and is also one that's a slightly different uh, model than the than the previous one. Uh, Osceola is located here in uh, western Wisconsin, right on the border with uh, Minnesota. We're about an hour away from the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan area, so a different dynamic than than Greenwood. Population is just over 2,500, and actually, with the census coming up, we're probably around 2,700, 2,800, because there has been some good single family growth over the decade. Uh, a little over 1,100 households, 56% uh, owner occupied housing, and 44% renter occupied. So we have a higher percentage of renter occupied than, than Greenwood uh, had in their uh, demographics. This is Osceola, aerial downtown. We're noted for our Cascade Falls, and also a historic train uh, runs through the community, also with that. Just looking at um, Osceola here, we've got Osceola here, and then uh, St. Croix Falls and the Stillwater. This is the, the uh, northeast suburbs of the St. Paul, Minneapolis metropolitan area with that. And this is a primary market area. The developer in this case hired a market study to be completed uh, by a company out of the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. In the other example, the developer prepared their own uh, in, internally, um, and, which is fine, uh, but this developer has used these before. He's developed a lot of units. He purchased uh, some existing units in the community and uh, renovated those and had a good sense for what the community needed, owned them for uh, several years now, and was just looking for different opportunities. But, uh, you know, he hit upon the uh, uh, some of the same things that we'll touch on. So the summary of his market analysis in looking at that, he broke it down by age, but the demand was uh, uh, 335 uh, units within that primary market area, uh, plus demand from outside the market area, uh, another 112. So people, uh, according to the analysis that was completed, uh, would be willing to locate from communities that were further away than the primary market area to locate here because of uh, it's a new it's a new apartment project, it may be closer to their work, a um, variety, of, variety of issues. Uh, so we have over 447 units in demand uh, from now or in 2019 to 2024. Uh, and they felt that the site that the developer was looking at could capture 25% of those or 112 units uh, with that, which is a substantial number for our community and in, in the surrounding area. Uh, here I do have Grassland Cooperative in here, but here's the owners of the apartments in Osceola. Um, didn't partner with anybody yet, but we did have uh, conversations with uh, existing businesses. Uh, they experienced the same thing that the Greenwood did, that their employees were driving further to work. Uh, you know, it's hard to find a place. They wanted to rent for a while before they purchased. And they had uh, a lot of the companies here in the community are manufacturing and and they have interns that come in uh, during the summer months and in no place for them to live. So trying to arrange places like, uh, for, for that, they hit upon the idea that maybe they could uh, lease some of the apartments and have them available for transient workers, interns, et cetera. So it's an interesting concept that may bear some fruit. Uh, so we opened up a dialogue with the, uh, the city on the need for financial assistance. Now this project isn't as far along as the Greenwood project, it's still in the uh, development uh, stage, pre-development stage, but there's a uh, strong interest to, to do something to meet demand. Uh, the uh, market analysis 
uh, there was one done on a county level and also one done by the developer, basically 0% uh, vacancy rate in the community is just if your apartment's vacant it's it's rented within days if not just week uh, with that uh, so on the southern part of the community we're looking at the uh, potential apartment development and this is um, state highway 35 in Wisconsin uh, this is a site of a senior uh, facility here uh, and this is the site that we're looking for for the uh, proposed development uh, there's a future quick trip going to be built this year it's a convenience store gas station and then uh, this is a concept plan of how this street would be proposed through here and other uh, development potential in the community the developers proposing 80 units then to capture that market so trying to fulfill a lot of the need uh, that was shown by the 112 units that uh, the market analysis had shown in the community so this proposal is 80 units, and it would be over $8 million in construction cost for that project. Uh, looking back on it, the street is extended to this point here. There's a temporary paved cul-de-sac right here. So the utilities extend to this point here. So there's no need to extend utilities to the site. The land is owned by the village because they purchased it when it was tax forfeiture, and they purchased it for the big reason was there was a, a project for senior housing that was in the works but needed some uh, some land at some point uh, but this area was needed because of the alignment of this road um, this section is meant to go away at some point because it's steep and uh, they need they wanted to secure this area and this was the only access point onto the state highway that really worked to do it so that was done about 10 years ago that that property was acquired uh, so they could look at buying the land from the village and they're estimating rents at one thousand one hundred dollars a month so the uh, potential assistance they're looking for is about 1.4 million to eliminate the funding gap. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. It allows for a return on investment higher than the uh, Greenwood uh, project that we'd shown just earlier. And it may be upfront financing or pay go or a combination of, uh, of those two. Uh, we're still in a discussion phase on, on that one. So here's an example of Polk County. Uh, median household income in the village of Osceola, per capita household income, and then more appropriately, the uh, owner income or renter income um, in, Os in Osceola here. And then this was the, some of the same numbers, but they looked at it historically. This came from the Maxfield research that did the, financial, or did the um, uh, market analysis for the developer. So 30% of uh, 35,000 is over $16 an hour. Uh, you have a month, uh, monthly rent then of three, $875 a month. And then starting pay for a number of companies uh, ranges from 18 to $20 an hour in the community. But there are others that make uh, more than that uh, in our community here. So from a project funding standpoint, um, this is again early on some of our first estimates of uh, what the equity or what the developers um, uh, money into the project would be and what type of a loan uh, would uh, that $8 million in value or estimated value for the project um, obtain. So we have a total developer funds that we're estimating right now at $6.6 .6 million. Now we're, the cost to construct is $7.2 million, the land, uh, 500,000 and that's pretty much made up of uh, the utility cost to that site. The land itself had a, has a pretty low value on it, but it's the utility improvements that cause it. We have our engineering and architecture fees, uh, village fees for you know sewer and water and the zoning applications, uh, pr preparation of a tax increment plan that's required by the state. So we're estimating just over $8 million in cost at this point. So it leaves us a funding gap of uh, $1.4 million that we need to, to close. But the estimated tax increment of the district is a minimum of $2.9 million. And that's an estimate over the 20 year life of a district. But this district uh, may be able to be a redevelopment district. And I'll back up to this slide here uh, because it includes, uh, there's an existing farmstead here and some buildings and depending on how they create the district we may incorporate other areas outside the district that are in need of some redevelopment so that may follow then the district could go to 27 years uh, which i've shown on this slide here so we're at um, you know 2.9 million dollars here 
So same thing, he's looking at building one building, 80 units, uh, could you know come online for taxes, uh, collect here in 2023. So we're looking at estimated increment of over 218,000, um, less kind of retainage by the uh, city here of 20, 21,000 a year, uh, net tax increment of about 196. Then we have a cumulative bond reserve. So and we're looking at the uh, estimated payments here for the pay go uh, with that. So there is sufficient increment uh, for the project uh, to um, you know, put the utilities in. Uh, there's no street or uh, connection required or you know, utility connection that will go in at some point in the future. Uh, I expect that the, the city may use future tax increments or other funding to put the street in as other properties develop. And the internal rate of return calculation on this one ended up being 14% and customary is 15%. So as we develop the project costs more and maybe get the costs down and maybe the, the rents can increase a little bit or uh, maybe there could be a little bit more tax increment uh, for the developer, it'd be right around the 15%. But it's a very doable project and it's uh, it's it's uh, kind of a, would be a big win for, for the area here. So some of the observations that we've had in uh, in looking at uh, development um, with this with this unit uh, this project but also the other one but this one has come back come up a little bit later here now since the pandemic's been in place been hearing discussions from our economic development folks at the county uh, some you know potential renters some business owners that if you're looking at creating housing um, the typical creation and these 80 units were no exception of creating two bedroom, one bath units. Um, you may have an efficiency or, a, or one bedroom in there uh, or a couple of those, but they were saying, well, maybe more three bedroom units. And the rationale is uh, more people are working from home, more people uh, appear that they may continue to work from home because of how employers are looking at changing the structure of their business. And I've seen that anecdotally here just in Osceola of how that's happening. So, if you have a two bedroom unit and one of them is going to be an office, you know, then you're down to a one bedroom unit. A lot of people like the two bedroom units. So do we do three bedroom units and at least have an office space or make that an option? The other side of the equation, and we heard this in Greenwood too, although we weren't able to convince the developer there to build three bedroom units, families coming to a community to relocate, renting for a year, maybe two, while they find other options, build a house, etc. You know, a three-bedroom unit is really what is needed uh, in the community. Uh, so it's a discussion we're having, and there may be more three-bedroom units being built uh, um, in in this uh, in this project. Also, the discussion is, what do we do about internet? We will have internet in the buildings, all our buildings now do have it, but you know, what kind of bandwidth uh, should we plan for? And what should developers, would he be able to scale up as more people maybe work from home or demand more services uh, that you know, through the internet? A very good discussion. Our county here in Polk County is willing to help and step in. There are some grants from the state that might be available as a demonstration project to assist with that. Uh, one, to make it more attractive, but also um, because we think we're on the cusp of something really new in the community. Um, local employers, again, are interested in leasing units that I mentioned before, yearly interns, transient workers. You know, there's only two um, examples that we had. One, about a year ago, uh, the city administrator that replaced me here, our village administrator, uh, was relocating from eastern Wisconsin, and he's trying to find a place to live with, uh, you know, two or, well, he, based on his family size, three bedrooms, and very difficult time finding, just because it wasn't anything available. And if they were, they were income restricted. And he actually found a place four days before he moved across the state here. And the unit he left, or the, the place he was renting when he left, was filled within three days. <laughs> so that that is uh, yeah, an interesting example. We also had, I uh, was talking, um, and the, at our local hospital here, we have one in, in Osceola that uh, one of the new administrative employees was uh, staying in the hotel for several months before they uh, were able to find 
I think a house to purchase uh, with that where an apartment would have been a perfect situation uh, for that. So you know, these anecdotal evidence really um, kind of bears out uh, where we're at as a community and how we how we move forward. And it's things to take into account. Uh, not unfortunately, but developers and the developer that we're working with on the Osceola project, this these elements are new. It's not something they've done historically. Uh, in their units as far as you know wiring them maybe a little more extensively or building three bedrooms because maybe they've had issues where they don't fill them as fast or they don't get the rents that they think they should from a three bedroom unit so it's a it, it is a conversation to have and ultimately it is um, mostly a, the developer's risk on that but with the the city involvement the village involvement uh, with the project maybe there are some incentives that could be put into place at least to encourage uh, some of those types of units for three bedrooms to see how the market bears out, but trying to minimize the risk to the developer to do so. Um, we're just trying to find that right balance in the community uh, to kind of to serve everybody's uh, uh, needs uh, for that. But it's nice that uh, we have you know developer uh, that's interested in our community, and it does it does help that we're in close proximity uh, to the uh, Twin Cities area for that. Uh, recently here in Polk County and then in adjacent uh, Barron County and if I'm not mistaken Burnett County all bordering each other up here uh, countywide uh, conducted um, housing studies to determine their level of housing need and all of them have shown that there is uh, a great need for you know apartments housing also single-family uh, uh, housing and you know affordable affordable continues to be underserved in our areas and but again there's a, a number of programs that are designed to assist uh, that housing but there's um, limited programs tax increment being the only one we've, we have so far that's able to uh, assist the market rate housing um, that we're trying to make affordable um, you know but within within a certain range so it's a um, very, uh, very interesting uh, dynamic that we have and look forward to working on it. I was going to point out, I think, one more thing on our development here in Osceola is that uh, uh, the future, uh, the, the quick trip here, um, just in a kind of an aside when you're when you're looking at uh, where apartment developers like to locate the developer that we're working with uh, that's looking at the 80 units he is he says we always like to locate near uh, quick trips the convenience stores and and so do our residents because you know it's a convenience option for them to be able to um, go to the store there you know quick get gas or the convenience items uh, and such with uh, with that um, and there are some communities around where Quick Trip is expanding in this area, so we'll see if apartment developers are interested in sites that are near them um, in, in, the, in the coming months as, as that uh, bears out. Uh, a couple of other things to, to note here in Osceola is there's a trail along here that's been started construction, and the hospital is located further to the south off the map, but the trail is designed to extend uh, down to the hospital. And we're, I think this, the village would be looking at um, tax increment to assist to in creating that trail to get out to the hospital. There is an exercise trail at the hospital with uh, equipment to be able to, uh, uh, to exercise. And they also have a fitness center out there that's open to the public uh, with that. Downtown Osceola is located right up in here. And it's meant that uh, the, the trail would kind of wind its way down this vacated roadway at some point and then go down into the downtown, uh, the businesses and the grocery stores and and uh, hardware store are located down there too. So we're trying to create those connections that we feel that the apartments are then con really connected to our community and they could um, uh, could really be be a be a significant uh, part of it. And they they're on the higher ground, so they could have a nice uh, a nice overlook over the area. In Wisconsin, the tax increments uh, can be spent outside of the district within one half mile of the district if 
there, if the district itself or the development within the district generates a need for such improvements within a half mile. And certainly uh, the sidewalks and connecting this development to the community in general is a, is a big point for that, that they can be considered that and uh, tying, it, uh, tying it into community and also make it a more attractive development uh, uh, for that purpose. Heading back down here. Talked about the observations. Um, this is my contact information and, and I think we could open it up for questions at this point. Okay, wonderful. Um, we do have uh, questions coming in and folks, if, if you have any more questions, feel free to go ahead and type those in the chat box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel. Um, let me go ahead and get these organized here. The first question, I can't do two things at once. I'm putting my webcam on. <laughs> it's fine. I'm just, I can't do two things at once. Okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the first question is kind of an overarching um, question about all of Wisconsin. How does Wisconsin handle hold harmless property tax districts, schools, libraries, et cetera? As far as schools, uh, there is a uh, state, it's within the tax income law in the state that the state makes up the shortfall for any funding to the schools. Uh, as far as libraries, um, I think, most, if not all, libraries in Wisconsin are either locally um, run or managed or at a county level, locally meaning municipal or county. So they, um, um, they along with the local governments, have to bear the cost of not receiving the increment, the tax increment. So they're not made whole in that scenario. Okay, now we're going to turn to some questions specifically uh, about Greenwood. Um, mm -hmm. Why is there not a two-year lag for tax increment assessments on a second building? Well, that is a good question. On, I will. I'm just going to look back on that. Oh, wrong way. If it appeared that way, it might have been an error on my part in how I constructed the uh, presentation. Let's see, two building. Here's the second building. It is constructed. So I'm having it constructed. It may appear it's, well, I suppose you can't see that. Should I share the screen again? Um, we can see your screen. You can, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so yes, so it's constructed in 2023 and it's 2025 is the tax collect year. It's how I've um, set up the, how I set up this, this screen, because uh, here was the construct year for the first mm -hmm. one, and in here this 23 is going to be a construct year but it's not going to be till levy 24 and then 25 that it's going to be uh, a tax collect year. So it um, there will be a two year lag. So if I didn't represent it right, I apologize, but it would be a two year lag and I'll have to look at how it's represented here more closely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one. How did the city uh, Greenwood include design requirements for the apartments? Oh, yes, uh, they did. In the development agreement, the city did include uh, a section that said they uh, had uh, design approval on uh, the the exterior of the building, the exterior improvements, the facade, and the site for site planning improvements. Because they, they did want it to fit into the character of the community and you know, just wanted to say in that because of public dollars that were going into that. So very valid and uh, and uh, well thought out by the community too. Okay. Um, were there any forms of long-term rent control in uh, the Greenwood apartments? There was not a long-term uh, rent control in the apartments, although that item was discussed. 
um, at the uh, at the council level, and it was felt that uh, given the size of Greenwood and its staff, that it might be burdensome to administer, and they didn't want to uh, be a a drag on the developer or how they managed the project. But it was a concern in working with the developer. They felt that 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 was that excess rents weren't weren't going to happen. But you know, there's no con they didn't have any control over it. If they could have worked out an efficient mechanism. They probably would have included it. Okay. Next one uh, again, Greenwood. Mm -hmm. okay. Does the city use property taxes to operate from? not income tax. Yes, the city uses property tax, not income tax. So all of it, well, majority of his income comes from property tax. There are two state aids that they receive. One is general government aid and the other is transportation aid. Okay. All right, so now we're going to move off of Greenwood here. Next question. Um, these are good questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Did did you receive any pushback on the tip from the school board due to the loss of the jurisdiction's general fund review re or revenue? I'm sorry. Revenue. Uh, actually, we didn't. Um, it's in in many cases you do receive pushback from from the school district on on loss of revenue. I know there's a state formula that tries to make that up, but uh, state um, formula for school funding is kind of beyond my wheelhouse. But as I understand it from others that know better, uh, the formula doesn't always make up for all the uh, the aid or the revenue that's lost to the school district. But in this case, the uh, the uh, school superintendent, uh, in addition uh, to being the school superintendent, also sat on what they call the joint review board. Uh, and that was a board that reviews all tax increments uh, in the jurisdiction or is actually created for each tax increment, but could could administer multiple ones. And he was very supportive of uh, the tax increment, mainly because, uh, well, he saw the need in the community, but among his teachers and staff, the same issues of trying to find um, a place to live uh, that affordable at affordable rent, you know, quality uh, housing. It was just difficult. So that kind of outweighed the other issues. Okay. Um, would you mind throwing your contact info back up on the screen? Oh, no problem. Yes. Um, and again, folks, if you have any other questions, we're, we're, looks like we're running out of questions here. We have one more, oh, a couple more coming in. Um, were there uh, any employer set-asides for units created specifically for those that need units for interns or anything like that? They're in the Greenwood, when we weren't privy to all the conversations that the developer was having with the Grassland Cooperative. So although I don't know that, I think that there were some set-asides in, in that one for some of their uh, staffing needs. We're a little too early in the Osceola discussion of a set aside, but I wouldn't be surprised if we do negotiate one uh, or some set asides for for those, just because of when I attend the uh, economic development meetings and hear hear the need and they're trying to find places for interns to live. And actually, I think what they're finding is some of the other staff at the facilities are leasing out a room in their house or renting a room mm -hmm. in their house as an interim, and and that's okay and such, but. I think we can find some uh, some solutions here and work together. So, okay. Um, are you aware of any bicycle or pedestrian improvements around the Greenwood project, similar to Osceola? Uh, looks like it's just far enough from downtown along Main Street to discourage walking or biking uh, without facility improvements. Right. There, there was a, a street project completed just prior to the discussion of this that. Um, that worked its way toward that development. Um, they didn't include it in the, the development agreement or the project of extending the street, but there were discussions on if they had excess increment. And I believe they were working with uh, another group to apply for grant funding for trail improvements. 
Uh, I think if if increments are collected in excess of what they need or if they have some money, they will uh, put some in because that was a topic of discussion. Just couldn't fit it all into the funding they had. Okay. Uh, what is the time anticipated for rent up? They anticipated, uh, I think, six months to a year to rent up in the Greenwood uh, case. In the Osceola, it's a little early to be estimating, but some, based on some of the demand that we see, I think it could be six, eight months. Um, it, it may be less in the Osceola case. Okay. Uh, General question about tax increment. What would you say to communities that are nervous about leveraging future growth? Are there certain red flags to avoid in um, tax increment work? Uh, yeah, yeah, there, there <laughs> are. <laughs> and uh, well, in Wisconsin, they have they have some control at, at the state because only you don't have only 12% of your tax base in a in tax increment districts collectively. Um, you can go over that because of certain if your tax base drops overall or certain things happen, but then you're prevented from creating new tax increment districts. So the 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 issue is, uh, you know, how much value in your community or, or how much tax do you want to forego? Either locally or for you know school districts and others, for the improvements that you that you're looking for, and it's a, you know it's a political question uh, to to decide uh, that that issue, but it's an important question because uh, as we mentioned, there's competing interests for that money: uh, police officers, public works workers, improvements to the community, and I can say that um, because of the downturn in the economy back in 2008. Communities like Osceola, until just recently when they decertified a district, a lot of our tax base was in in those districts, and it did, you know, kind of constrain us a bit as a community to do that. So I think, you know, looking at it and and determining, you know, what your what your risk assessment are you receiving the benefits that you want, whether it be housing or uh, blight removal or whatever, for what you're giving up, and to do that and be very conscious and you know upfront about that discussion with the developers they they will understand too and they, you know they're looking for for certain things but but I think as the the analysis pointed out look at their rate of return look at some, what's reasonable for them but if they're asking for things that are unreasonable then there's no reason to do it because you're giving up too much so that's that's the uh, kind of the the red flags I'd see so I guess uh, bouncing off of that, is it typical for smaller developers uh, and or rural areas to accept a lower internal rate of return? Um, maybe, but not necessarily. Um, actually, in some cases, they might want a higher rate of return because they see more risk in a rural area because the the pool of potential renters is not as high. So if something happens with a local employer or whatever might change, they're worried they might not be able to fill to fill their units um, uh, with that. So I think the big thing in, in looking at, and this was a discussion with the developer in Greenwood, is they did their internal market analysis. And they said, well, and that's fine. They shared their numbers with us and how they arrived at us. But the more information you can have, and particularly if you have it done by uh, like a, a market analysis firm, is better because that's what you can base your numbers on is the demand there it puts more people at ease that they can fill the units like in the case of Osceola you have 112 that they figure they can capture but you're building 80 so you have a demand that you know um, pretty confident that is built in we're a little less certain in the Greenwood one a uh, developer felt comfortable the city was okay with it but would have liked more information but in the end you want to pay you know five six eight thousand dollars for a study you know, maybe, maybe you do uh, with that. So it's it's looking at, you know, that, that return. So you may want to look at, you have to do maybe a little higher um, market return in some rural areas just because of the risk involved for the developer. Thank you. Um, 
did the the two jurisdictions in your two examples did they actively look for or encourage the apartment developers yes they did in the in the greenwood case they did they did encourage uh the developer um uh, it was the uh uh the employer grassland actually reached out uh to that but the greenwood was you know they had the issue before and they were you know how do we find developers and how do we you know market you know get our community out there and the uh the owner at grassland happened to know this developer and, and talk to them and in osceola the case this developer bought in our community bought many units and uh you know renovated them and then as we were discussing i was administrator at the time when it first started i pointed out well you know there's a need here and everything and then he said, oh, I'm, I'm interested, but it, it took him a year or so to, to, to redo his existing units. And then he started looking and, and, uh, and seeing the need and, and, and did the market analysis. And that's how I continued my, my work with him after I left the, uh, the village. But uh, so that is a, a good point is how do communities, and we're grappling that with another, is how do we get your, your name, your, your need, and the potential for a developer to... Um, you know, make money uh, out to in front of them because you know, for some developers, it's there's a lot easier targets out there. Uh, you know, uh, to to do that. So it's just uh, just getting into that development community and just keep pointing up. Yeah, we've done a study. We've looked at our market. We have zero vacancy rate. We have a need, or we have employers that are willing to invest. Anything like that to get their attention, uh, to do that to make it um, easier for them not to do all their work for them, but just to make it easier for them to understand uh, what you have and you're willing to work with them. Great, uh, next one. Uh, can you expand on, on the qualifying criteria for tax increment districts uh, under Wisconsin law? Do districts have to exhibit blight? And then I guess to follow up then on that, um, it, in your experience if you know is that is the wisconsin law kind of the general law across the board or are there other states that look at it quite differently uh i know of well the, the two states i work most in is minnesota and wisconsin wisconsin in the the mixed use district that we that we created in in greenwood did not have to have blight in it you had to have a mixture of commercial industrial and residential uh, or two out of the three of those needed to be included uh, with within that um, designation and no more than I think 35 percent of the land could be existing like platted developed land uh, I believe is how it's how it's worded with that so that is one that gives you uh, some flexibility in creating a district to meet a housing need although they don't have a specific housing district you can use it for that and, and also assist commercial and industrial uh, with that now minnesota law is um, uh, uh, different in that uh well i should back up wisconsin law also has a redevelopment district and that one has to show blight uh, and then and in dealing with the blight you can undertake housing you can undertake um, commercial or industrial uh, development whatever happens to fit the area but once you qualify for blight it's a lot more flexible in how you then want to address it with what's going to go in there to replace the blight with that uh, Minnesota, um, similar blight, uh, re, you know, redevelopment district uh, for blight. Uh, in Wisconsin, I believe it's you need at least 50% of the area uh, to be encompassed with either existing structures, uh, streets, or utilities that like no longer make sense. Uh, Minnesota is similar to that for their redevelopment and their blight. They have a what they call a renovation and renewal district in Minnesota, if I'm getting the term right, that has um, a lower threshold for that. It's not considered blight, but renovation and renewal. And then they have a specific housing district where it's for affordable housing uh, that you can you can utilize, and you can use that for you know, like new housing developments. And I did work on one in Minnesota, based you know with well almost all the types, particularly a new housing development one for affordable housing, single family affordable uh, housing. And they have an environmental one in in Minnesota too. Um, that you can actually almost write the land value down to zero if you're dealing with contamination. Thank you. But you want to check your state laws because they can vary a bit in each state. Okay. Um, 
How do the additional costs associated with the development get counted when figuring out the true impact on the public budgets for delaying revenue associated with the TIF? The additional costs of, uh, I'm a little unclear as to the additional costs, you mean the additional costs in the development or the additional costs that the city has, uh, maybe? How do the additional costs associated with the development mm -hmm. get counted when figuring out the true impact on the public budgets? Well, there are additional costs, but they're but it's a it's a city costs, point. public service city costs. Co oh, okay, <laughs> public service costs. Got it. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought they were going for. On that one. Yeah. You're right. Um, uh, we you do look at it as a a, a cost of um, you know if you have you know more miles of street or some additional you know, utilities, uh, what kind of maintenance do we have to do? Uh, in this case, it's an incremental cost in both Greenwood and, and in Osceola that the extension of the street isn't that great. So there's not a lot of additional uh, costs for, for plowing. Uh, there's more meters to read. So there's additional costs there. But it's a point that um, uh, when I was here in, in Osceola too, we did, we did track that from the sense of how many more meters were we adding, how many others, because it, it, there's a break point where you're gonna need another employee or you're going to need another street worker or depending on if it's a really large development, you know, do you need other equipment? <laughs> and police plows, fire. Well, yep, police fire. That's that's the other thing is 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 just tracking uh, those things. And and actually this uh, touches on the point earlier um, about uh, um, you know what are you foregoing in that and that's trying to find that balance point of if, if you utilize tax increment too many times, you're not capturing that uh, increment and being able to use it for the police fire and and the uh, the other workers or equipment or whatever they may need and then you have to wait for the districts to decertify before you can capture that again and then you're you're kind of then behind uh, the curve with that so one way to offset that at least a, a little bit when you're looking at the uh, that retainage number that that the city had was 10% or some amount that you're retaining, that can go to the staff and and help replace. You know, we're monitoring the district and others. You know, if there's additional costs, some of that could flow to the uh, to that, or at least what you're what uh, the administrator or the the clerk is spending their time on for tax increment, then that frees up money that general fund money that could be used for the other uh, other departments with that. So um, it isn't always easy to, to track that, but we do track, you know, if there's increased hours and things because there is a break point coming of when more services are needed. Okay, I think we're gonna wrap up. Um, yeah, we're almost to the 2.30 mark. Uh, thank you. Joel West for joining us today into the Wisconsin chapter for hosting today's session. Um, and thanks to all of you for joining in on with us today. Uh, we are recording this webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search planning webcast on YouTube. We'll have a PDF of the presentation available here shortly on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And that is also where you can head over to register for all of our upcoming sessions. So again, Joel, thanks for joining us this afternoon and You're everyone welcome. have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. All right.